glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're glad, wave at me. I want you to tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're here. Tell your neighbor, you're here for a purpose. Amen. Psalms chapter 95, verse 1 through 3 says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. Amen. And it says, for the Lord is great, a great king above all gods. Amen. If that's true, give God a big hand clap of praise this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord. We just want to thank you, Lord, uh, for what this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord. We got here safely, Father God. And, and now, Lord, we're just going to take this time to just lift you up, Father God. You are wor worthy of every praise, every praise, Lord, that we even more, Lord. So we just pray, Lord, that we would open our heart, Lord, to receive what you to receive what you have for us today, Lord. In your precious, precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. How many have a testimony this morning? This first song is called "My Testimony." If you have a testimony this morning, give God a big hand clap of praise. Amen. We thank you, Lord. We have a testimony because of your work on the cross. And we thank you for that. Listen to this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I'm glad about that. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Thank you, Lord. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Grace rewrote my story. I'm testified by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I love it that we're justified by his work on the cross. Amen. Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. My God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Thank you Lord Listen to this If I'm not dead and you're not done Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Church, I want you to think about something. Sometimes we look at certain situations in life and we feel like things will never, ever change. Or there's no way God can fix this situation. But I want you to know that there's power in the name of Jesus. I said there's power in the name of Jesus. There's more power in the name of Jesus than the doctor's report. There's more power in the name of Jesus than that situation in your marriage. There is more power in the name of Jesus than the power that is holding your son or daughter from following the Lord. Amen. 
God's power is great. So if you get nothing else from today, I want you to know, I want a spark of hope to just be birthed in your heart today that God can and will do it. Amen. Despite what our eyes see, I want you to believe that God has the power to break any stronghold. He has the power to bring you through. Can I have an amen? So I want you to sing this bridge with us, and I want you to sing it with power and with faith, okay? If I'm not dead and you're not done, come on, say it. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe, oh, I believe, this is my testimony, this is my testimony, from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, this is my testimony, oh, I'm alive, this is my testimony. From dead to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. We thank you, Lord. Because of your work, we have a testimony. Yes, give God a hand clap of praise. Jesus paid it all. Amen.
great this morning. Just lift your hands and thank him. Lord, you are great this morning. The same God that divided the Red Sea is the God we worship today. The same God that provided manna and cloud by day and fire by night is the God we are serving today. And the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I tell you this so that your faith would increase. Because, Mike, you said some crazy things earlier. God is bigger than the doctor's results? Yes. Yes, I believe that. God is bigger than your situation? Yes. If you believe it this morning, come on, lift your hands and just thank you, Lord. Let us magnify him this morning. Let's magnify him in our hearts, Lord. You are great. You are great, Lord. And worthy to be praised, Lord. And worthy to be praised. Our great Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. The great
Sound beautiful this morning. Lift it up. It's your breath. It's your breath. Mike's going to continue leading us. But if you have a need this morning, you know, Mike talked about how God is greater than the diagnosis. He's greater than the problems you're facing. If you need someone to stand with you this morning and believe God with you for that, that God is greater, that's what we're here for. So as we continue to worship, I just want to encourage you to slip out of your seats, come up here, let us agree with you in prayer that God will meet that need. Amen? Amen. Amen. The name above our names, Jesus, you are the
seated. Welcome to Spring Creek Fellowship. If you're watching online, let us know you're here. Check in, say hello. If you have any prayer requests, you can send us to us and we'll be happy to stand in the gap for you. Amen. Awesome. So just a few announcements here. 
Uh, I say a few. We have a lot, actually. So we've got a lot going on. Uh, we've got Teen Hangout Night coming up this Friday. So uh, uh, for those of you who went to camp, Camp Reunion Night, get to see everybody again. Or for those of you who didn't get to go to camp, come and check it out and hang out with us. We'll have some pizza, talk about uh, what I say we're going to talk about, see who paid attention. None of you guys remember what I said we're going to talk about? Camp. Guacamole. Thank you. We're talking about guacamole, whatever that means. I thought that would be so, like, you know, life-shattering. You'd be like, guacamole, that makes no sense. Why are we talking about that? That's what we're still going to talk about. So come and be a part of that. And if you'd like to come as an adult and help out and be a sponsor, just a, a chaperone, you're more than welcome to see what that's all about. So um, uh, we're doing VBS here pretty soon, August 8th, 9 through 11. 6 to uh, 8.30 is what the sign says, so we'll make it to 8.30. We'll, we'll see if we can make it to 8.30. I'm going to try you're out of here by 8 o'clock, hey, that's cool too. Um, so uh, bring uh, all your, your kids that you know. Bring the kids that you don't know. Um, you know, don't offer them candy or anything. Stop by and like say, hey, kid, get in the van. Don't do that. But, uh, you know, invite their parents to bring them or something like that. So uh, we're going to have vacation Bible school is what that is. So it's a, it's a kid's church on steroids, so to speak. So that's going to be a lot of fun, okay? We're going to give a lot of stuff away. We have lots of, of cool stuff to give away. So be a part of that. Um, and then... Uh, we have um, Canton Trade Days coming up where we get in a big van and we travel to, uh, to Canton and go a couple days there. That's a lot of fun. So um, sign up. Is there a sign up for that already? We're going to get a sign up for that eventually. That's not until October. So just plan ahead. Um, and then we're also for VBS, for back to school, all that stuff. We're going to be doing a, a few things. We're getting supplies we need for VBS and with supplies we need for back to school to fill some backpacks. So I have here a uh, fill a backpack thing pre-k through third four through six and seven through twelve um, you can donate any of these items or you can donate in the offering uh, and then mark that for schools backpack school supplies and we'll buy whatever we don't get donated um, and you can leave that in the back there's a sign up in the back for vbs and for uh, the backpack so uh, that helps out and then also um, we have um, if you need it we're going to have a special time set aside for back to school haircuts so if you need a haircut or if uh, you need some, some special assistance with that, because they're expensive, man. I tell you what, I'm I'm just I'm glad that I'm losing it, so I don't have to go get so much, so much, so much haircut all the time, right? So there's a blessing in that, amen. All right, so there's enough of that. Okay, so let's take up the offering. Um, you can give online at scf.today/give or text any amount to eight four three two one, and then you can also give all your money in the back, amen. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for everything you do for us. Thank you, God, that. Um, way back when you brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, you, like, like Pastor Mike said, you brought them across the Red Sea, walked on dry, grant, dry ground, and you gave them, the, the, you gave them the, uh, the promised land. And all they had to do was obey. And so in our obedience, God, in our offering, we give you an obedience. I pray, God, that you bless us, Lord. Bless it so that people can come to know you and that so the church can grow. We love you, Jesus, your name. Amen. If you are going to Kids Church, you are dismissed. Let's go. get a lot of people watching our online service, but uh, Opal's always over there watching uh, with us, so she, she always chimes in and lets us know she's there. So everybody turn around, look at that camera, say, hi, Opal. Hi, Opal. We love you. All right. I think that's it. Got to get my back-to-school haircut here soon. All right. Well, welcome. We're going to continue on the Lord's Prayer series this morning. So why don't, let's dive right in. Would you stand with me and turn to Matthew chapter 6? Matthew chapter 6. I'll put it on the screen for you. You also have uh, Bibles in the chairs in front of you. But let's read this together. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, I forgive you, and then you may be seated. <clears throat> We've been working our way through the, the Lord's Prayer, the, uh, the Our Father, the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. John taught his disciples, 
why don't you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus gave them this prayer. I, I don't believe that he meant it as a, a magic formula, as a potion, as something to recite over and over again. In fact, he warned his disciples, don't go on babbling like the pagans do, who think that they'll be heard because of their vain repetition. But he said, when you pray, pray like this. Uh, it was a pattern to pray, not written in stone, not exactly what to pray, not exactly in this order, but how we should pray. And as I often walk through this prayer in my prayer time, I use some different patterns for prayer. Patterns are very helpful because I find without a pattern, I tend to just dive right into my own selfish needs. Uh, wah, wah, wah. I need, I need, I need. Lord, I need this, I need that, I need this. And, and a pattern disciplines me to, to, to take some time and say, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. And just praise him. Thank him for who he is and what he's done. Thank him that I have access straight to the, the throne room of God because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. I get to come to our Father in heaven and say, holy is your name. And then I say, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, uh, that, that I'm focusing on thy will, thy kingdom, thine, not mine, I like to say. Uh, Lord, help me to get a hold of in this prayer time what your will is. How, how I fit into what you're doing in the kingdom. So many times as pastors, we're, we're guilty of this. We come up with our grand plans and schemes and, and say, okay, this is what we're going to do as a church. And then we come to the Lord and say, Lord, please bless what we're doing. And, and really the, it, the challenging thing is instead to wait on the Lord and say, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to do? And how can we partner with you and, and be a part of what you are doing in this community and around the world? Give us this day our daily bread. On one hand, it's, it's nice to know that Jesus taught us that it's okay to ask, that we can ask for what we need. On the other hand, it's also important just to acknowledge that he's our source. We, we, uh, we don't have too much of a problem with daily bread here in America. We have food everywhere. We don't spend every day trying to figure out how we're going to eat today and how we're going to eat tomorrow. Uh, we have more problems with obesity than we do a lack of food. At least I do personally. I can't speak for anybody else. Um, but I, 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 have, I, I need to lose about 20 pounds of daily bread. Uh, but the important thing is to acknowledge that he's our source that daily he is our source and he sustains us. And then we get into this section, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And last week we talked about forgive us our debts, our sins, acknowledge that we really do need forgiveness. Uh, don't, don't treat your own sin lightly. Take an inventory and then leave those things at the cross. Confess them to the Lord. And this week we dive into the latter part of that verse as we forgive and Perhaps that's the harder part of the verse, and we're going to dive into this in just a moment. Then we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Pray, Lord, keep temptation away from us and deliver us from evil. Lord, protect my family from the evil one. Uh, Lord, uh, watch over my family. Lord, if there's any attack on me from the enemy, we just rebuke that in Jesus' name. And then uh, that little extra part there, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wrap it up and remind ourselves it's, it's all about him. Today, let's camp on that verse 12 again. Such a short verse. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And yet somehow I'm taking two weeks on one verse. Uh, if you've been around a long time, you know that sometimes I cover a full chapter or four or five chapters in one sermon. And yet today we're, we are just working on the B side of this verse. Here's the main idea. As we come to the Lord and ask forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done, we must do so with a heart that has forgiven the wrongs done to us. As we pray, forgive us our debts, we have to do so with an attitude that's already forgiven our debtors. Now, last week, I, I broke down this confusion over the, the word there, debts. Some of us say debts, trespasses, sins. Uh, they're all really synonyms for sin. Uh, whether we look at it as falling short or missing the mark or deliberately violating God's word or failing to do what he's told us to do, we need forgiveness. 
And Jesus paid the debt that we could not pay. If we confess our sins, God forgives us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. One of the most famous Bible verses, great memory verse, right? It sounds too good to be true. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. What's the catch? There's no catch, but there are conditions. We must repent. We must turn from our sin. We must confess and ask God for forgiveness, and we must forgive others. I look back, and on this topic of forgiveness specifically, I'm sure it's worked its way into other messages, but I, I've preached on this specifically uh, two other times in the past three years. On, on one hand, it's not that much when I see how much Jesus talks about it. On the other hand, this is so crucial, we probably need to visit this uh, a couple times a year and remind ourselves of the importance to, of, this un, uh, of getting rid of unforgiveness in our lives. Because when I study scripture, I see that Jesus brings it up multiple times. <clears throat> Here's a few examples. We have our, our passage today, our Father in heaven. Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we stop there. But you'll notice that the chapter continues. That these two verses are added there. For if you forgive, verse 14, other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. That's why we pray and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You know, we know this verse traditionally as forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our, uh, those who trespass against us. Um, I've done this survey a few other times. Uh, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, how many of you are debtors? You f forgive us our debts and debtors. Just me, raised in the Reformed Church. Uh, okay, there you go, yeah, Dutch Reformed. Uh, how many of you are trespassers? Forgive us our trespasses. As we, okay, all right. How many of you have modernized it and you just say, forgive us our sins? A <clears throat> couple of you, <clears throat> all right. But it's interesting because those versions actually kind of miss the grammar of the original. In the, in the original Greek, this phrase has this sense of being complete and yet ongoing. Um, in the NIV and the NASB, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And it captures the complete. So maybe a combination would be a best, a best way to render the original. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven and continue to forgive those who sin against us. Because it's really not talking about just a one-time transaction, it's talking about a heart issue. We want to live as forgiven people, right? We say Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Right. Well, in order to be forgiven, we need to be forgiving right. people. We need to be people who just live in this constant state of we are forgiving People. It's a hard issue. <clears throat> well, how quickly? Here's a good question. How quickly must we forgive things done to us? From what I can tell in the scripture, extremely quickly, because as we go through these passages, I don't see a lot of room for holding on for a while first, right? Because that's what we want to do. We know as Christians, we're going to have to forgive them. When I, I hear people say, I know I'm going to have to forgive them. No, it's not that you're going to have to forgive them. You must forgive them. Now. Yesterday. Okay? It's not, it's not like you have, it's not like there's this grace period like, oh yeah, I know I'm going to forgive them, but I'm going to chew on this for a while first. <clears throat> I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till they're sorry. I'm going to really grind this in there for a while. Then I, I know eventually I'm going to forgive them, but I'm hanging on for a while. I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see that room. Let's look at another place where Jesus expounds on this teaching of forgiveness. Mark records a time in uh, Mark chapter 11 where they're walking along. Jesus is hungry, sees a fig tree, and says, ha-ha, lunch. All right, going to go get me my power bar. 
and uh, walks up to the tree. There's no figs. And Jesus is like, what good are you, fig tree, if you have no figs? And he curses the fig tree. And, and the disciples kind of like, well, that's harsh. Let's go about their business. They come back the next day. The, the fig tree is just withered. It's just dead. And the disciples are blown away. They're like, what in the world? The dude cursed a fig tree, and it just died. And they're blown away by this. And Jesus tells them, you're blown away by a fig tree dying? That's small potatoes. And he says this, Mark chapter 11, starting verse 22, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, stay on this verse, Macy, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. It's a great passage, right? Faith inspiring. We, we, you know, if you've ever been in, in one of the faith churches, they love that verse, right? That's the name it and claim it verse. If you believe it and believe it hard enough, you can do these things. Great faith. But he goes on, verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Whoa! Way to drop a bomb on us, Jesus. We are just asking about the fig tree, and you got to go messing in our hearts. We're, we're, we're blown away at your power that you curse a fig tree and it died, and then you give us this great bit of inspiration, but then you got to go meddling. You know, we're just excited about cursing fig trees, and Jesus jumps from fig trees to unforgiveness. Why? Because he's saying, hey, guys, you want to walk in power. You want God to hear your prayers. I'm going to tell you how to go to prayer in faith and believe and do great things for God, but... If you come to God and you're walking in unforgiveness, God's not going to hear that prayer. He's not going to hear you. He says, when you stand praying, you're going to go pray, and you realize you hold something against you, you've got some unforgiveness in your heart, you go deal with that instantly. Forgive them so that your heavenly Father may forgive your sins. Because you can't stand there in faith and be cursing fig trees and throwing mountains into the sea if you've got unforgiveness in your heart. If you want power, if you want God to hear your prayers, if you want your Father in heaven to forgive your sins, then you must get rid of any unforgiveness in your heart. Here's a couple quick questions. So what things should we forgive? And who should we forgive? Verse 25, put that up again. Verse 25, let's see what it says. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything, or somebody, ever say anything, anything, against anyone, say anyone, anyone, forgive them. Not a lot of wiggle room there. Jesus make a good lawyer. It, anything against any, you, you, you ever notice like anytime you sign a contract, there's 18 pages of small print to make sure that like you can't wiggle out of that, you know, in case of this, that, and the other thing, make sure there's no wiggle room. You don't need a lot of fine print here. Jesus says, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. Here's another time Jesus brings this home. Parable of the unforgiving servant. You remember this parable? Jesus tells this story. There's a king, and he decides to call his accounts, and there's this guy who owes millions of dollars. This dude owes millions of dollars to the king, and he decides to call in the accounts, and the guy comes up, and he's like, dude, I cannot pay you back. My bad. Well, the king should throw him in prison, but the dude's like, hey, I've got a family, I've got kids. There's no way, you can throw me in prison for the rest of my life. There's no way I can pay this back. Would you please have mercy on me? He begs the king for mercy. He did not deserve mercy, and yet the king forgives him. I, just distracted for a moment, how did this guy wind up owing the king millions of dollars if he didn't have any way to pay it back? He, he must have been like borrowing this and just blowing it. Like, hey, I've got this big adventure, you know. Give me a couple million dollars and I'll start a business and it'll be great for both of us. And then he just like blows it. He just took it to Vegas, put it on black, came up red. It's gone. But the king forgives him. So this guy goes out and he turns around and he finds a guy that owes him a hundred bucks. By the way, I'm doing the conversion for you. It's all about shekels and minas and that kind of thing. But literally... 
the guy owed millions of dollars and got forgiven, and he goes and finds a guy that owes him a denarii, which is a day's wage. So let's say 100 bucks, okay? And, and, and he, he shakes this guy and says, you owe me 100 bucks. And, and the guy's like, oh, I'm sorry, man, I don't have it on me. I, would you please have mercy on me? And the guy goes, no way, and throws him into prison to, to be, to, to be uh, 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 you know, just tortured until he can pay it back, because, you know, torture pays really well. Well, the servant throws him in jail, and the king hears about this. Because other people talk, other people see this, other people heard the story about the guy who owed millions and got forgiven, and then they see him turn around and try to shake down this dude for a hundred bucks and have no mercy on him, and so they rat him out to the king. And the king hauls the guy back in, Matthew 18, starting in verse 30, 32. Then the master called the servant in. What does he say? He says, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, in anger, let's pause for just a moment. Does God get angry? Jesus is telling a story, and the king is obviously, we're talking about the kingdom of God. He's, the king in this story is God. Verse 34, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. Because again, torture pays well. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father, whoa, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive them. And not just sort of forgive them, forgive them from your heart. Because we don't like to think of God as angry, right? We think of good old God. He'll forgive our sins, grace, mercy, peace, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, forgive us our debts. But not if you're walking in unforgiveness. So what prompted Jesus to tell this parable? I've spent time going through some of these parables, and it's, it's interesting because a lot of the parables are directed at the Pharisees, right? These self-righteous guys that walk around. They're, they're Jewish elite, and they're, not, they're looking down on the Gentiles. They don't think that you know, Jesus should be you know, hanging out with all these drunkards and sinners. They, they, this, he's, they don't think he's a very good rabbi. Um, he's doing stuff on the Sabbath, like healing people. And, and Jesus tells all these stories to get at them. Is that what's happening here? No. This was not one of his stinging barbs at the Pharisees. It was at one of his own disciples. This is one of the guys that's with him every day. Who? Peter. Back up to verse 21. This is before the parable. So here is the story that prompts the parable. And for you to understand it, it helps to understand the context here. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? By the way, Peter thinks he's being generous here because um, Jewish rabbis would teach you have to forgive like people three times. And like if you're really merciful, you do it four. And so Peter thinks he's really up in the stakes and he's like, hey, how, how many times can we forgive them? Seven? And Jesus says, not seven, but 77 times. Or 70 times seven. We're not sure which one it is. But what is Jesus saying? He's, he's saying a ridiculous number of times. The story of the unforgiving is told of the unforgiving servant is told to the disciples because Peter had just asked, How many times do I have to forgive somebody? Peter. Peter. Remember Peter? Open mouth, insert foot, Peter. Peter, who will go on to deny Jesus three times and need a little forgiveness himself. This guy wants to know how many times must he forgive others. Peter's life flashes through Jesus' mind. Jesus shakes his head and sighs, and he says a ridiculous number of times, Peter. How many times do you want to forgive? Depends. How many times do you want to be forgiven, Peter? How do you think in this story about a guy who owes a ridiculous debt that he could not pay and was forgiven, how do you think the king would feel if he found out that this guy turned around and didn't forgive a hundred bucks. How do you think he would feel? Jesus tells us, 
Verse 34, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he, should, until he paid back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. God is so good. He's patient. He's kind. He's merciful. He's forgiving. But you want to know how to make him angry? You want to know how to tick him off? Harbor unforgiveness in your heart. Pretend that the way that you were offended is somehow worse than the way you've offended God. As Jesus hung on the cross to pay for our sins, while on the cross, he said, Father, forgive these people crucifying me. They don't know what they're doing. While he's being crucified, he forgives. What kind of example is that to us? What offense have we encountered that is somehow greater than the perfect Son of God being crucified for our sins? What offense do we have? What, what wrong are you carrying around that is somehow worse than that? And yet Jesus says, forgive them. Tell Jesus all about it. Tell Jesus about how so-and-so said something that hurt your feelings, so you're not going to forgive them. See how that goes. All right. One final note before I wrap it up. And this may be the most valuable thing you learned today. This might just set you free. So if you're taking notes, get ready to write this down. You ready? Unforgiveness is dumb. This is going to just set some of you free. Because some of you, you know, sometimes all you need is a little mental tick and that kind of thing. So, somebody's going to be fuming about something. You're going to be struggling with unforgiveness. And then all of a sudden, you're just going to remember this. Unforgiveness is dumb. Let me explain to you. It hurts you more than it hurts anyone else. And the worse that that other person is, the less they care if you forgave them. Like, oh, it was really bad. Yep. And they probably, if it's really bad, they probably don't care. They don't care. You're only hurting yourself. I won't go into all the research, but can I tell you, Christians, that even secular science has figured this out? That they, the secular science, they've done studies and they've learned that unforgiveness leads to heart issues, high blood pressure, psychological disorders, anorexia, bulimia, anxiety, depression, sleeplessness, brain hemorrhage, and even cancer. Unforgiveness will literally make you crazy and kill you. By the way, again, that study is about unforgiveness on the person not forgiving. They didn't study the person not forgiven. They didn't study the other party. You know why? Because they don't care. They're free. It's the person holding on to the unforgiveness that they studied, and they said, you know what? If you hold on to unforgiveness, it'll make you crazy, and it'll kill you. Unforgiveness is dumb. It also opens up spiritual doors. You ever wonder how people become demon-possessed? This is a big doorway. You want to become demon-possessed? Hold on to bitterness. Chew on your offenses. Tell others about your offenses. Share that bile with some friends. Get a support team of people that, that can be mad with you at that person. Get your unforgiveness posse going and then stir up dissension. The Bible calls it witchcraft. Don't try to spiritualize it. You share all your wrongs with somebody else. It's witchcraft and you're opening spiritual doors in your life to demon possession. Don't spiritualize it. Slay it. Call it what it is. It's sin. Someone has put it this way. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> I, I, I've got another illustration. Austin, come up here. I bought these chains just for this, this purpose here. Every time I do this illustration, I kind of wish I had bought some lighter chains. But... <clears throat> If you ever need to tow a car, talk to me. So let's pretend I'm, I'm really mad at Austin. You know, he was supposed to play that one part in the song, and he didn't. He blew it and that kind of thing. And so I, I'm trying to get over it, but I can't. So I just don't forgive him. So I'm just going to wrap these chains around him. And 
just put these chains on him. I'm just gonna try to anchor this here a little better. And uh, I'll wrap him up in my unforgiveness. And Boy, I got him, didn't I? And now he's gone, he's clueless. But you know what? I don't forgive him, so I'm just going to keep walking around with this. He's not sorry. So I'm not going to forgive him. Boy, aren't I showing him. Unforgiveness is dumb. It's like wrapping yourself in chains and you think you're doing something to somebody else. That's just dumb. So here's your points. Remember, release, remind. I don't always alliterate, but I did today. When you pray and forgive us our sins as we forgive, number one, remember your sin. Remember that we need forgiveness. And it's, it's a lot more than we think compared to those of others. We tend to minimize our own sin, minimize the things that we've done, and magnify what others have done. Um, some of you posted on Facebook in recent weeks, and I saved it, uh, this meme from Alistair Begg. When I fail to forgive someone, it's because I've exaggerated the offense against me, and I have minimized my offense against God. I, I think of this, this thing that somebody did to me, and I'm so offended, and I'm so wound up in that kind of thing, and, and as I do that, if, if I'm hanging on to that unforgiveness, it's because I don't really appreciate what Christ did for me. I don't really think I deserve hell. I think I'm, pretty, I'm actually a pretty good person. When Jesus forgave me, it wasn't a big chore. You know what I mean? Because I'm basically a good person. But this thing that somebody else did to me, that's really bad. But remember your sin. Remember, we need forgiveness. <clears throat> and if we believe that the blood of Jesus is enough to cover our sins... Is it not enough to cover the sins done to us? Um, there's an old song I used to sing <clears throat> and um, talked about, you know, the blood of Jesus is enough for the wrongs that I've done and the wrongs done to me. The blood of Jesus is enough for the sins I've committed. It's also enough for the sins that other people have done against me. And if I don't want... God to hold on to the way I've offended him that I need to release what others have done to me. Remember your sin and then release your offense. Release your offense. <clears throat> release is not the same as minimize. That's why we teach our kids when somebody apologizes, say, I forgive you. Don't say it's okay. It, it's a natural response. When somebody, oh, I'm so sorry to this. And they go, oh, it's okay. Right? It's kind of like uh, in Spanish when, we, when I, I say gracias, you say de nada, right? Which is literally of nothing. It means it was nothing. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, it's nothing. All right? Um, in English, we say thank you and we respond, my pleasure. Has Chick-fil-A taught you nothing? No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> I, I ate a Chick-fil-A so much, I've, I've swapped it. I don't say you're welcome anymore. I say my pleasure. And that's great with thanks. But with an apology, we say, I forgive you. And, and the other person, we say, I forgive you, not it's okay. And the, the, thing about, the thing about forgiveness is we don't have to wait until somebody says, please forgive me, to forgive them. It, it's a transaction. You're not saying it's okay because it's not okay. All right, but let me, first of all, let me, someone's sitting here and they're thinking, boy, this is all well and good, but you don't know how I've been hurt. It's not like somebody just said a word that hurt me. 
they did something. They violated me. They violated my trust. They violated me physically. They vi- they, they've harmed me in a real way. It wasn't just words that made me feel bad. This person genuinely harmed me. And you're telling me to forgive them? Yes. Because forgiving them doesn't mean what they did was okay. It's not okay. That's why it requires forgiveness. If it was okay, we don't need to forgive. But that thing was not okay. And yet we forgive. It's it's a transaction. It's a decision. It's an act of your will. You must make this transaction in your will before you communicate it. I've come to a decision. I forgive this person. This is something you've got to have a little conference with yourself. When you recognize unforgiveness in yourself, you don't have to involve the other person right away. You first have to make a transaction with yourself. Am I going to forgive? You must make the decision. Am I going to release this offense or hang on to it? And you make that decision like it's a transaction. Now, do you communicate it to the person? I'd say it depends. If they're seeking forgiveness, absolutely. If somebody's like, please forgive me, then absolutely communicate to that to them. But sometimes people don't even think they need forgiveness. You don't have to let them know how much they need forgiveness. Okay? It's not your job to bring them. Hey, have you ever had that happen to somebody? You didn't know you offended somebody, and they're like, I just want to know I forgive you. <laughs> and I'm not passive aggressive at all. If, if they don't know, you don't necessarily need to bring it up. It, it just depends on the relationship. Maybe you, can have a, maybe you can have a satisfying conversation, right? Maybe you're close to somebody, you can have a satisfying conversation. You can say, hey, uh, you know, by the way, uh, Mike, when you told me to just stop singing during that song, it hurt my feelings. <laughs> but I forgive you. And Mike can be like, oh, wow, I had no idea I hurt your feelings. I just... I told you to stop singing because you sounded bad. And uh, I didn't mean anything personally. I'm like, no, I, you know, well, I forgive you. Maybe you can have a satisfying conversation, but you're not always going to have that. Sometimes, sometimes the people don't care that they hurt you. And they won't care if you forgive them. And you may just have to process this yourself. It's not your job to make them sorry. That's not a condition. You, It's not your job to make them sorry. Don't wait until they're sorry to forgive them. It's not part of the equation. Jesus never said that. What did he say? He said, if you hold anything against anyone, you forgive them. He didn't say if you hold anything against anyone, go tell them about it, make sure they understand, make sure they get really, really sorry, and then forgive them. He didn't say that. Maybe they're a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe they're a friend, and maybe you can seek some reconciliation, but maybe not. Here's a note, and I put this in last night, and this is, this is I, I wasn't going to bring it up this time, but I, I was prompted to last night, and I believe it's for somebody. And this is this, leave justice and retribution to God. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Leave justice and retribution to God. God keeps good books. And let me tell you, here's another reason that unforgiveness is dumb. Because as long as you are standing in that place of offense, you are blocking that person from God's wrath. I, and, and this has been very helpful to me because there's been many times where I've been, I've been ripped off in one way or another and I've just thought, in, you know, it's, it's angered me, it's upset me. And I've just kind of come to this point where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to tell Jesus on you. <laughs> and I do. And I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, this thing happened. This person wronged me. I was ripped off. But you know what? I release that. I give that to you. I forgive them. And I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> now, part of me wants to stand around and see if you smite them. Smite. <laughs> but I have to get out of the way. 
I have to get out of the way. It, 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 it's mine to repay, revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So you have to, you have to leave justice and retribution to God. As long as you stand in that way of trying to make sure that person pays, you're standing in the way of God setting that right. And you would have no sense of what justice was were it not for God. Justice is part of the character of God. Even the cries today, you know, where there's all these cries for social justice, we want justice on this earth, everybody wants justice, right? Nobody would have any idea where that came from were it not for God. That is part of God's character. And when you are wrong, if you keep working on the retribution, you are standing in the way of God. Give that to the Lord. He keeps good books. All right. Remember your sin, release your offense, and then going forward, remind your heart. Remind your heart. See, your will must inform your emotions, not the other way around. Don't wait until you feel like forgiving. Okay, your mind and your will have to make the transaction, I forgive. And then you've got to tell your feelings, hey, feelings, we forgave that. You have to remind your heart you've released it. This is the hard part for a lot of people. They say, boy, I know I should forgive. I said that I forgive them. But then I remember what they did, and I get so angry again. Well, you have to remind your heart. Your heart's going to be like, oh, I'm upset about that again. And you have to say, yeah, heart, I know. It was a bad thing. That shouldn't have happened. That was wrong. But remember, we forgave them. So heart, you need to get your act in order because we forgave them. So you need to release that. We've forgiven that. And it, that's how we want God to act toward us, right? I, I, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if God's up there like, man, Andrew, I know I forgave you, but I just remembered again what you did, and oh, it made me really mad. You think God's stewing like that? Is that how we want God to act toward us? Is that how he does act toward us? No, the scripture reveals his heart. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Anybody say, thank God. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Walking in unforgiveness involves a lot of reminding yourself that you've released it. It's like a muscle that you build. If you, if you keep reminding yourself of the offense, if you let your heart inform your will... Your heart's like, oh, I remember this and I feel so bad. And your will is like, yeah, that was really bad. And you go back and forth. And if you do that, that's how you keep churning up bitterness and bile. But when your heart feels this thing again, you feel that pain again. You know how that is, right? I'm not pretending that anyone can just be like, I forgive them and then never have that feeling again. That feeling comes up. But when that feeling comes up, can't let the heart remind the will. You have to have the will remind the heart. Oh, I feel that feeling again. And then the will is like, yep, you feel that feeling again because that was a bad thing that happened to us. But I want to remind you of something, heart. I want to remind you of something. Uh, Jesus died for our sins, and that was enough. And so we forgave that, and we turned that over to the Lord. And then your heart's going to be like, okay, I can, I can trust the Lord with that. Can you trust the Lord with those offenses? And you have to remind your heart of that, that constantly, but it's like a muscle that you build. The more that you walk in unforgiveness, the easier that will get. You have to practice it, though, genuinely, from your heart. You have to stop sharing and reliving those offenses. Catch yourself. If you find yourself thinking about it over and over again, if you find yourself sharing that with other people, you got to catch yourself. you got to re remember that, hey, I'm a sinner. You have to release it, and you have to remind your heart that you've done that. Good news. The grace to forgive is in the power of the cross. As we live in Christ, we learn to forgive like Christ. He will help us. We have the Spirit of Christ within us, right? So that same Jesus Christ, who on the cross was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, lives in you. And if you lean into the Spirit of Christ in your heart, 
the power of God will help you walk in forgiveness like Jesus Christ walks in forgiveness. Mike, would you come? I'd like to always offer this. If you are listening this morning and you just realize, you know what? I've never come to the Lord and asked for forgiveness. I don't know that I'm walking in forgiveness with God. How do I, how do I get my sins forgiven from the Lord? You surrender. You give up and you say, you know what, Father, I'm, I'm tired of running my life. I surrender to you. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to be my Lord, be my Savior, be my King. I want to I wanna be a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you forgive my sins and be my Lord in Jesus' name? And if you do that, the scripture is clear. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. For as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. If you do that, you've become a son. You've become a daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you have that direct access to the throne that we pray when we pray this prayer, our Father in heaven. Now, congregation, I want, you, I want to just walk you through this. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want you to, want you to just to acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner saved by grace. That it took Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, took the blood of Jesus to forgive your sins. We are all sinners, forgiven by God. Now I want to just ask you just to think, examine your heart. Are you holding anything against anyone? Is there anything that you haven't released? Is there, is there any offense, any wrong that you're just churning on? The Lord wants to set you free from that this morning. Right now in this moment, let the Lord prompt you. And as he prompts you, maybe it's something so big you don't, think you can forgive. Maybe it's something so trivial you didn't realize that you needed to forgive it. Whatever it is, whatever the Lord prompts you right now, that thing that person said that they did, in your heart, forgive them right now. Just release it to the Lord. Release it to the Lord. Bring it to the cross. Get out of the way. Lord, we just release things to you. Lord, every offense, we just lay it down. That doesn't mean that we won't see, that this person won't see consequences. It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. It just means that the cross is enough. So we release that to you in Jesus' name. Church, this place is not a club for perfect people. It's a community of forgiven people. and We need to communicate that. But you want to hurt your witness? You want to hurt your witness for Christ? Be an angry person that's slow to forgive. But you want to blow people's minds and demonstrate that the difference that Christ has made in your life? Do what Jesus told us. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Be quick to forgive. When, when you are wronged, don't be, don't be looking for retribution, but instead turn that to the Lord and say, you know what, I just give that up. Unto you, O oh Lord. And then when people ask why, how can you do that? How can you, how can you, how can you be free of that? It gives you a chance to explain to them it's because you've been forgiven. It's because you owed a debt that you could not pay, and Jesus paid it for you. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we are forgiven people, Lord. Help us to walk in forgiveness. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, that as people have heard this message, that some chains have dropped off them because they don't have to carry that around anymore, that, that it's freeing to forgive. Lord, we give that to you. Lord, you're big enough to carry every one of those offenses. We just release it to you in Jesus' name. Because, Lord, when we stand before you and we, we ask you to forgive us, when we ask you to meet our needs, Lord, we want you to hear our prayers. And so we stand before you, Lord, as people who need forgiveness, but also people who walk in forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Lord, bless your people, Lord. Prosper them. Bless their health. Have your hand on them this morning, Lord. Give them strength, Lord. 
And Lord, set up opportunities for us to be radical witnesses of the hope that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Come back Wednesday for the Bible Project. God bless you. Go with God. He